Well, good morning. Good morning. Okay. Oh, we're all very excited, aren't we? I'm not giving anything away, you know what I mean? <laughs> this is where you give, no? Yeah, no. Uh, so great, our Be Rich series, week two. Uh, and as Arlene said, yeah, go out to the Four Milton Keynes Hub. You'll have a card there uh, which you can fill in. Some of your details, it shows the four different uh, priority areas on there, uh, all with those different colored balls as well. And you pop that into the box. This gives us a good visual to see uh, what interests you and what really is the concerns that you feel are in our community as well. On the 23rd of February, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we're then going to have a, an offering where we're going to ask you all to give. Uh, and we want you actually just to give uh, 10 pounds, just 10 pounds towards this Be Rich uh, series. And we just feel that this was an amount that we felt that everybody could uh, be a part of. Uh, and we truly believe that if everyone gave, we could make a massive difference to these community projects and initiatives. Do you know what big churches can do? They can make a big difference, yeah? We can make a big difference. And so I'd encourage you to bring that 10 pounds if you can. And heck, I know some of you can probably give, put, give more than 10 pounds, but hey, um, I believe we're going to do some great things. 100% of that is going to come in. 100% of that is going to go out and lives will be changed and continue to help those people uh, affected. So great to hear some stories and more to come um, in the following weeks as well. You know, last week I was actually quite challenged uh, um, as we heard all about sort of the, the area and the priority area of homelessness. Um, and it really struck home actually this week. Uh, on Wednesday night, I dropped off my son Zach here to DK Groups, uh, went to the local Costa at the, at the stadium to actually prepare uh, for my message today. Uh, and on the way, uh, I uh, was co- sort of confronted by a, a homeless person who was who asking for uh, some money. He said, oh, mate, do you have any, any change? And I was sort of on a mission, and I was basically sort of walked past, and I was like, oh, sorry, I don't have anything at the moment because I had somewhere to be and I had somewhere to go. Um, I have a bit, of, a bit of a confession because I did have a bit of money on me. <laughs> I did. Um, and as I, before I even got to the Costa, I just really felt the Holy Spirit just really challenge me in that moment as I walked in my comfy shoes and I had my big winter jacket on, holding my laptop, walking into a nice warm coffee shop to buy literally whatever I wanted to buy to then prepare for a message about how we all can be better at being rich. (laughs) And I just felt God saying, you know what, you need to get back there and you need to give whatever you've got and give it to him. Because literally I was rich and I still am rich. We all are rich, and we can do just that little thing. Even last week, Mark spoke to us, and he even said if you earn just 15,000 pounds or more, uh, you're in the top 5% of wage earners in the world. That is fascinating. And in fact, there are millions of people who have so much less than that, who literally look at us and say, man, they are stinking rich, stinking rich people. The thing is, being rich can actually be quite an issue for you and me. And during this series, if you're going to be rich, we want you to be really good at it. Really good at it. The Bible talks about wealth and money so much. Uh, I want to give you one scripture here. Uh, In Matthew 6, it talks about it. It says, Do not store up for yourselves material treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasure for yourselves in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, desires, all that your life centers on, that is where that it will be also. You see, being rich is an issue. Because Jesus spoke about it more than he spoke about uh, heaven, hell, sex, grace, all of those things together. He spoke about money so much in the Bible that I think we've got some things to, to learn about being rich. He says something really dangerous about money. Matthew 19, it goes on. Jesus is actually talking to his disciples. He says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, it's difficult for a rich man who clings on to possessions and status as security to enter the kingdom of heaven And he says, again, everyone say again, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man who places his faith in wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Fascinating that Jesus is saying the same thing twice. 
He's actually saying, he's, uh, he's not just telling you, but he's giving you a picture, an analogy. Have you ever seen the eye of a needle? Have you ever seen a camel? It's almost laughable, isn't it? In the fact of there's just no way that could happen, but they're saying if you put your hope and your, your faith in wealth, there's no way that you can enter heaven just as much as that camel can't get through the eye of the needle. I was actually reading up about money and wealth uh, and in the Bible, and I was reading uh, a, a great sort of um, uh, blog by John Piper. And just an, an excerpt from there, he actually just said this. He says, he says money is dangerous. He says, if you have it and depend on it, it will kill you. He says, if you don't have it and you crave it, it will kill you. Money can kill us. Why? Because it reveals our hearts. And we're going to dig a bit deeper into what that actually means for us uh, today. Mark gave a great illustration last week. He said, if I gave you an option today, there was a million pounds here on the stage on this side. And if there was on this side, uh, God meeting your everyday needs, what would you decide? Choose right now. And I know a lot of us holy people here today would say, of course, (laughs) God meeting my... But really, I don't know about you, but a million pounds would be quite nice in my pocket right now. (laughs) Wouldn't it? You could do a lot with a million pounds. And maybe it just reveals a bit of where your heart might be. And this is a challenge for us today, this whole series. One being so temporal and one that literally will last forever. Last week, Mark also spoke about some of the side effects of being rich, some wealth side effects. I'm going to give all three of them up there because they were great. If you didn't hear the message, go back on Facebook, go online and check out the message. It was fantastic. He said, rich people confuse being rich with feeling rich. He says, rich people were plagued with discontentment. Rich people often suffer from a migration of hope. And we're going to just expand a bit more and unpack this uh, scripture of this series in 1 Timothy 6 as we dig deeper, because we really want you to get this message today, this whole series. So if you weren't with us last week, I'm going to catch you up real quick, real quick. So... uh, A lot of people, rich people, confuse being rich with feeling rich. Now, I have a a bag of goodies here, and uh, this sort of represents all of my my stuff, all of my my wealth, you know, all the things that I can can accumulate, and, you know, I I couldn't fit my car in there, so I had to raid my my son's toy box, but, um, you know, we all all have our car, you know. Uh, Mine's a bit different to that, yeah. And, uh, you know, we we all have our phones, and, you know, some of you have nice, rich people have nice phones, and... So we're gamers, you know, yeah, but that's fun and, and that sort of thing. And what else have we got in here? Uh, we've got some, some bracelets and some jewelry, and there's more jewelry in there. And, and I got clothes, and I got more clothes, and I got. You know. And you know what's really funny? Because when it comes to clothes, you know, we, we have so much stuff. We have so many clothes, right? Like, and, and this is what rich people do. Like they, they, they walk into their, into their bedroom um, and they have this wardrobe and sometimes some people open the door. Yeah, rich people will slide open their wardrobe door. Yeah? Yeah? No, 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 and actually, there are some rich people who walk in to their wardrobe. Anyone can walk in? No one's here? One person. Thank, thank you for admitting that. And you walk into your wardrobe And you sort of survey the area, the clothes that are from floor to ceiling, from left to right. And and I want you to finish this sentence because we've all said it. We've stood in front of our wardrobes and we've said, I just don't have anything to wear. wear." (laughs) So what do we do? We go out and buy more clothes. And then we can turn to a cross and I, can, and I know some women who literally have not eight, not nine, not ten, but 11 pairs of shoes. I don't know what you could do with 11 pairs of shoes. I only wear one pair at a time. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of 11 occasions when I would wear those shoes. And yet we go out and we buy more shoes. You see, we love to have this stuff. You see... A point that Mark made last week was simply this, is um, um, the more a person has, the more he or she wants. We feed that appetite of wanting more, and we, we go out and we buy more clothes and more stuff. It makes us feel good. This actually makes us feel rich, and we, we feed that all the time. And then what do we do? We, we actually start to 
to look around our family, our friends, and we start to not to look at what we have, but we start looking at what other people have. We start to compare ourselves to other people. We look around and we look at what we have, and we look and we, we think, what, what, who is out there? How you doing, Sean? You all right? <laughs> nice bag, mate. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I bet you got some nice things in there. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's, it's mesh. It's mesh as well. It's good. But we, we do this, don't we? We look at other people. We see what they have. We like what they have. We might be a bit envious. Um... And then we go away and we think, you know, I, I want to match that. Uh, I, want to, I want to do one better. You know, I want to, actually, in fact, we, we sort of, it's what we call about upgrade. We upgrade our things and our stuff. And, and sometimes we, we don't get rid of this stuff. This stuff usually goes in the attic, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and then we go and we buy um, nicer stuff. And so we go and we, uh, we, um, we just do one better. Um, <laughs> Anyone like shopping? <laughs> I like shopping. And rich people can afford this sort of stuff, yeah? Isn't it funny how when we, we get told in church all the time that you know, when, we, when we break down the, everything about our faith and, and it's all about God and it's all about people. And isn't it funny that when we look at, at the people, it, it turns from looking and cherishing people to their possessions. And it's fascinating that we go and we try to do one better. We, we put so much time and so much energy and so much effort into upgrading our lives to feel good and to feel rich. Let's thank Sean. Yeah? Okay. Can I tell you today that uh, comparison, comparison will always rob you of contentment. It always will. You'll always be discontent when you start to compare. And no wonder all of our rubbish tips, our recycling centers, they're literally overflowing with our stuff. No wonder we have this sort of talk about, uh, about the climate and how we're affecting that even. Maybe, just maybe if we compared ourselves less, maybe we would consume less and then would be just a little more content. Something to think about today. And as we sort of dive into this scripture of the series in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, uh, I wish we were to, in the time I've got left, just to really pull apart even more as we kind of journey through these verses uh, to look at what Paul said. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote this letter uh, to his younger protege, to Timothy, uh, and he goes to the heart of the issue with, with what rich people really struggle with. And he starts off like this. He says, command those who are rich in this present world. And that's the, just that one scripture that we talked about last week and we're just going to continue on. But he says, command. He says, command is another word for instruct. See, if you were going to instruct something, what, what would you say? If you could actually write a letter to actually start to say something to instruct rich people in your world, to re- what, what would you say to them? This is what Paul says. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be, what's that word? Not to be arrogant. Not to be arrogant. You know what he's saying? He's saying that that if you ever become rich, your inclination is always towards arrogance. Ever met some arrogant rich people? I've met some. And for some reason, unfortunately, we almost help them to be a bit more arrogant. This is what happens. We sort of walk into a room and there's this circle of people. And in that circle of people is, is that rich person. You sort of know. And, and you sort of feel like a mere mortal as you sort of have this conversation with these people. And all of a sudden, the rich person starts talking and talking. And then what do you do? You start agreeing with them. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And you start agreeing with this rich person. Why? Because they're rich. Because they must be the smartest person in the circle. They must be. Because when you get rich, they think they get smarter. For some reason, they, they, they think that their IQ goes up with their income. Crazy. And they believe it. And I know you're not going to fall for it. 
But here's the deal. You may have gotten rich because you're smart, but listen up here today. Getting rich didn't make you smart, yeah? But there is this natural inclination to start thinking you're smarter than, then eventually better than, because you have a lot of wealth. And you know what, 2,000 years ago, this was a big issue as well, just as much as it is today. Even in our culture, we kind of hear this saying about rich people. You might have said it, you might have, someone, you might have heard someone say it, or some variation of it today as well. It's be up on the screens. What, what, what did you say? This is, this is a variation. We, we say, he's worth a ton of money, but you never know it. Have you ever heard that before? He's, he's worth a ton of money, but, but you'd never know it. Well, why do we say that? Why do we say that? We usually say that because generally we, when it's rich people, you sort of know it. They, they, they carry it. They, 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 they wear it. You sort of just know that they are rich. And Paul's saying, look, if you are lucky, if you are so lucky or you've worked so hard or you're so smart or so blessed, regardless of how you think you got there, he says to these Christians, once you cross that imaginary line and suddenly you have more than you need or you have more than most people, he said, don't let it go to your head. Don't. Even in the message version of that same verse, it says this. It says, tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money. So you're probably thinking now, oh gosh, well, am I? Aren't I? Am I? Am I? Arrogant? Am I? Arrogant? Am I not? And then he goes on. He goes on to really the heart of it. This is, this is powerful. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. <coughs> Big idea right here. This is what he's saying. He's saying, when you start to have more money, when you, when you start, when you finally get that raise, when you finally get that promotion, when, 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 that, when that quarterly or six-monthly or that yearly bonus comes in, and, and, and it feels really good. When all of a sudden things start to look good, something starts to begin to happen to your hope. And a lot of us don't see it coming. It's not a decision we make, but as your wealth or your lifestyle increases, our hope begins to migrate. And it migrates towards that accumulation of wealth. And he says, look, warn those rich people don't let your hope migrate. Don't let your hope move and get attached and associated, wrapped up with all about your finances because that would be a terrible thing. We even read in the writer of Proverbs actually talks about wealth and he says it this way. This is, this is great. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 11. He says, The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. Isn't that fascinating? They imagine it. Why do they imagine it? Because it's not true. Because it's literally a pipe dream. It's a vapor. They, they imagine it because they are deceived. It's, it's not true. We, we read it in the message version. It gives it a different perspective. It says, The rich think their wealth protects them. They imagine themselves safe behind it. Which basically says that the more that you kind of think, the more that I accumulate, the more that I have, I can build up this imaginary wall. That, that, and if I have this imaginary wall, no one can touch me. And I can, I can build this wall up to safety. And even the Living Bible says this, the rich man thinks of his wealth as an impregnable defense, a high wall of safety. And then he says, what a dreamer. Let's all say that together. What a dreamer. Let's say it with a bit of attitude. Come on. Like, pfft, what a dreamer. Like, it, are you crazy? Like, why would you do that? It's just imaginary. And you start to begin and think to yourself and begin to imagine that there's an amount of money that if you could ever accumulate it, if you could ever save it, your walls would be so firm, they would be so extraordinarily safe that they would be able to protect you, your family, your children, your grandchildren, all the generations to come. Somehow you can save your way to safety and when that does happen, you, your hope shifts from something and someone to your wealth. Last week we answered the question, 
And the question was, how much do you need to accumulate to feel safe to build that imaginary wall? And the answer is the same for every single person here. More than you currently have. In fact, in Money Magazine, they did a survey, uh, and they surveyed all of their readers to say, uh, what is rich? How much money do you need to feel and to be rich? Do you know how much money they said? Five million pounds. Five million pounds. In, in everything, liquid assets and all those, everything that can, you can access quite quickly. Five minutes. So he said, what? So if I give you a million pounds, that will give you, no, we're not, we're not one. Two million pounds? No, no, not two. Three, three million? No, four million pounds? No. What about four and a half million pounds? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel rich. It has to be five million pounds. And I guarantee if you ask them the question, do you feel rich? I bet you they'll say, you know what? I could do with just a little bit more. You see, when you begin to put your hope in wealth, here's what's happened. Here's what's going to happen. When wealth becomes your hope, you will feel compelled to hoard. Compelled to hoard. Not let things go. Anyone, anyone like to hoard? Anyone? It's like our attics, isn't it? Full of stuff, Yeah. Because what would happen if we let go of some of those things? Because we're sort of building up this imaginary wall. You see, as you become wealthier, something happens where you, your hands start closing and start holding on to everything that you have, not willing to let it go because it has this imaginary fortress, this wall that you think that it's going to actually do good and it's going to keep you safe for all of time. <coughs> That's what happens when you put your hope in wealth. And I don't know about you, but I can imagine that some of you maybe don't consider yourselves to be rich yet. But maybe your heart has already started to migrate towards it because, it, you know what, it, it just happens. That's what money does. What does Paul go on to say? He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, what does he say next? Which is so uncertain. Which is so uncertain. Even the message version says things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Fascinating. I was walking to work the other week and I was confronted with uh, one of those massive big trucks that, that, that sort of take away all of the old and sort of broken down cars. You know the ones that you sort of you drive onto the truck? The one that sort of like hangs on the front and one other one there and you, you know those trucks? Yeah, the ones you drive behind you think, oh, don't fall off, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you sort of swerve around them. And, and, and I was confronted with them putting up another car. And as I was going towards this truck, I, I noticed that these were not old cars. In fact, these were like brand new cars. But what, one of the wing mirrors was, sna was snapped off and one of, the, one of the windscreens was broken into and, and someone had hit the back of one and one of them was dented. And so they were, they were, they were brand new. And these were nice cars. You know, these were these were Jaguars, yeah. These were Range Rovers. These were these were really nice, really nice. Think about think about the nicest cars that you guys own. Yeah, think about that. And people who had bought them only three months ago, literally three months ago, because they're all like sixty-nine plates. So yeah, three months ago, who were literally sat in them in, in the luxurious, probably smelt the the leather and just just like liked being in the car. Isn't it fascinating that something so new, putting so much energy into getting that to, to, to show off to the world that you have this, and you know what happens? In one instance, it's gone. Here today and gone tomorrow. Fascinating. And you think that they're trying to build up this imaginary wall and in one instance it's broken down and we're putting our hope in that? Like, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Yet sometimes our heart can gravitate towards exactly that. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God. Put your hope in God, who richly provides. If you put your hope in wealth, you hold on and hoard everything in your world. But can I tell you, 
It's so much harder for God to give when you have your hands so clenched on your stuff. You see, when you put your hope in God, your hands will start to open. Why? Because he wants to richly provide for you. And it's way easier to receive from him when your hands are like this than they are like this. And do you know what happens when it's easier to receive when your hands are like this? It's way easier to give. It's way easier to give. And that's what we need to get today. What I love as well in this passage is that it says, I'm not going to put my hope in God who richly provides us with everything. He wants to meet our everyday needs. And he's not going to just provide, he's going to richly provide. And he's not just going to give us some, he's going to give us everything we need. And not to be miserable, not just to walk and have, you know, just, oh, you know, like this, you know, he, what's that last word in that scripture? It's for our enjoyment. This is good news today, yeah? This is good news. And if you put your hope in God, he's the one who will richly provide. So don't put it in things. Don't put it in stuff. Don't put it in your wealth. And assess your heart this week and actually say, where is it migrating to? And does it need to come back to God? You see, if we sum up this whole verse here today, it's simply this. Why? Why would you put your hope in the provision when we have the opportunity to put your hope in the provider? And that's powerful. It really is. You know, as we sort of close today, I really just want to almost declare something that hopefully you'll get across to you today and how our hope needs to be in God because he's the one that richly provides. And I know that as we go into next week and the week after, we're going to continue on in this passage as we see what now happens if we do have our hope in God. Well, what do we then do with that? Where do we then go? So please come back and please stick around in our series. But I want to declare something today, and I believe this can be life-changing. I'm going to say it, but I want everybody to say it with me as well. I'm going to say it first. I, I will not place my hope in riches, but in Him who richly provides. Now, I want us also to say that as a declaration today. Can we say it all together? Let's say it. One, two, three. I will not place my hope in riches, but in him who richly provides. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for our time today to have the opportunity to talk about wealth because we know that it's a big issue. You spoke about it so much, God, because you want us to be really good at being rich. God, you've given us so much. So God, help us to not be the sort of people who you say in your word. We don't want to be arrogant people. We don't want to be people who just has our hope in wealth and who who just accumulates and, and tries to build up this wall of safety. No, because we only know that we are safe in your hands. And that you are the one who provides. You are the one that gives. You are the one that where we can receive and have a rich provision and so much enjoyment. There is so much in you, God. So help us today as we are back into our rich lives to not focus on those things, but to focus on you. And maybe, just maybe, we'll be ready to give, make a difference, God, in this world with all that we have. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come down, and I would love to have people on my left and right. I'd love to pray for you. Uh, Otherwise, have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.